Latina Voices is proudly sponsored by Continental Airlines, the official airlines of Latina Voices Smart Talk. Goya Foods, when it's Goya, it's got to be good. And Fiesta Mart, serving you since 1972. A show about universal topics with a Latina point of view. Stay smart. Today on Latina Voices Smart Talk, Islam and the firestorm that followed after 9-11 and continues today. We have a woman's perspective from Dr. Dina Alsawayo, Associate Director of U of H's Women's Studies Department, also a federal judge who uses books to show she is no ordinary judge. Hello everyone, I'm Minerva Perez, the executive producer of Latina Voices Smart Talk, a show about universal topics with a Latina point of view. Joining me, as usual, are my co-hosts, Houston PBS senior producer and anchor, Patricia Gras, and Texas super lawyer, Sofia Adrogué. Ladies, it's time for some Smart Talk. Absolutely. And I have a book uh, that I picked up a long time ago, actually, and it's called World Religions, mm -hmm. and it's by Robert Pollack. And uh, being that we're going to be talking about Islam. Of course. Uh, I wanted to read this. It's a reference book that d basically uh, decodes all the religions. And about Islam, it says this. It is a major world religion that originated in the Middle East after Judaism and Christianity. While the distribution of Islam throughout the world generally covers Africa, the Middle East, and sections of Asia and Europe, it is becoming a growing religious factor in the United States. More than six million Muslims are United States residents, and that number increases every year. And this book was written in 2008, so wow. you can imagine how many more um, Islam um, Muslims, Muslims, I would like Muslims. To read that. exactly. It's, ve it's very interesting. Well, it talks about yeah. Muhammad, about the beliefs. What about a great thing to read. Uh, it, no, it is. and actually it's for very children, yeah. for yeah. children, and right. those we mentioned to know the differences. Yeah. You know, interestingly, you read on world religions. I was also empowered and. In thinking about the two women that we're going to have on, I thought of women empowerment. Mm -hmm. So I reread, it's just, it's more than anything images, it's thought provoking, called Women Empowered. And it is a CARE, the organization, put this together. Secretary Albright led the charge. And the preface, she talks about the fact that it is about a reality and about hope. What's the reality? Out of the 800 million illiterate people, two-thirds are women. Mm -hmm. One out of every three women suffer from abuse. But the unfinished business of the 21st century is educating women. Right. Because exactly. with that comes empowerment. And how about you, Patricia? Well, because of the social revolution that we've seen in the, in the Arab world in the past months, um, I thought I'd read again the, the tipping point, how little things yes. can make a difference. And one of the things is, you know, there's a moment of critical mass and who creates that. And I thought very interesting to, to read again about the people who create these revolutions. It's the connectors, the people who link us to the world, the mavens who provide information, and the salesmen who make people believe in them. So I just thought this was a very good oh, book to good. read right now to understand what's happening in the Middle East. Good. All Perfect. right. Goes down our line. <laughs> Absolutely. When we come back, in the Mideast, Islam is a religion. To some, it is also a symbol of terrorism. We'll return with perspective right after this. The controversy that surrounds Islam continues a decade following the September 11th attack on U.S. soil. The contention around the religion and plans to build a mosque near Ground Zero have reached the highest levels of Congress with many questions about the perceived radicalism of the faith. Joining us today is Dr. Dina al Associate Director of Women's Studies at U of H, who teaches the history of Islam, the modern Middle East, women in the Middle East, and Islam in the 20th century, among others. She will speak to us about the unending quagmire, educating us and putting it in perspective. Islam has taken front and center in a congressional committee trying to find answers to the radical actions of a few here in the U.S. who have tried to attack from within. We'd like to know the tenets of the fast-growing faith here in the United States. Welcome to Latina Voices, Dina. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Um, you asked about the tenants. Right. 
um, and I'm happy to tell you about those, but really I think the discussion is, is not so much a theological one as it is a social and political one. So we can, we can talk about the duties of a Muslim person, both men and women, to pray five times a day, to fast during the month of Ramadan, to profess the faith, to give to the poor, to do the pilgrimage, but that doesn't really give you insight into what's going on in the world today. Right. So, but those are Let's the talk tenets. about that, what's going on. Obviously, one of the things that have, very controversial things that happened recently was the King hearings. Your, your take on that. I think the best way to understand it really is to put it into a historical context. Thank you. And that is, um, you know, the U.S. history is different from that of Europe, as you know. And, and Europe had colonies and so had a sort of interaction with um, the Arab and Muslim world that the U.S. didn't have. And it seems like, and it, seem, it seems to me that when we meet, that is, the United States and the Arab and Muslim world, it's always over crisis. It's never, um, you don't hear about students backpacking through Kuwait right, exactly. like they do in France and other places. So it seems the introduction is always very contentious. And so then the um, entire discussion is driven by the crisis. And of course then it's, it's going to turn out a certain way, just as if you had a neighbor that you were just moved in next door and the first thing you have is crisis. Isn't that going to determine the relationship? That's right. That's interesting point. Well, so when we look at the history of um, the Arab and Muslim world, and its relationship with the United States, if you just if you go out and ask any random person, when's the first time you heard about uh, Islam or Arabs? Because a lot of times those are confused and they're very separate things. Um, you know, just go go anywhere and ask. They might say what. Uh, the 73 oil embargo, perhaps the 67 war. Or so 9/11. Or 9/11 for younger Which people, in and right? Which itself is. Right. Right, so controversy that, as its paradigm. Exactly. So that's going to drive the the question. It's, it's not um it's not a, a, a different sort of set of questions that, that people come to the topic with. It's why do they hate us? But 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 for the average for the average American, what what is relevant about Islam today? What a good question. What a big question. Yeah. It may not be so much about Islam as it is about. Um, a set of tools that really every person should have. One is critical thinking. With anything you approach, you should do it with critical thinking. Um, and then maybe to learn about other parts of the world. I mean, we do a great job in our schools. This is among the best school systems in, in the world right here, right? A very, very um, rich country. So learn about other parts of the world. It's not one big blob called the Middle East. What is the Middle East? Where does it start? Where does it end? What is a Muslim? How is it different? Are they all the same? So they're the five duties of a Muslim person. Is, is that is that all there is to it? No, there's so much more. There are 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and they're as varied as, as anything. I have to ask you this, because for me, whether it's right or wrong, misconception or appropriate conception, for many, the, the, the concept of a, of, of a Muslim or a Middle East woman and the confusion they're in is at odds with feminism. I came across an interesting title and then I'm going to provide it to you and, and ask you to educate us. Born Again Feminism. How a movement that sadly may be growing stale in the United States can draw new inspiration from our Abaya clad sisters in the Middle East. Please explain to me, to the audience, etc. When we may not necessarily see a woman, that all we get the luxury of seeing is a tiny portion of right. the veil or a purple. How are they? Uh, they're, in, they're empowered, how are they getting empowered, and what do we learn and what do we do? <laughs> I have to go with you. <laughs> how much time do you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Summarize in 10 seconds. <laughs> See, this is really part of the problem, okay? Um, the best way to learn this stuff is to spend a lot of time on it. So, but in the United States, and I guess most of the world today, we want sound bites, sound bites right? right? Tip, 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 tip. What are the duties? <laughs> well, you got that's, 12 seconds. Right. That's just that does a disservice to the whole thing, to the whole nuance. Everybody should learn in a nice setting and take their time. You know, classes are the best way to do this, but that's not going to happen, right? So, how do we do this? Okay. A couple of things about your very good question. Uh, first, 
I, I suppose for many people in the United States, the um, various forms of covering that some Muslim women engage in is a deal breaker. You see a woman in the veil and you go, oh, she's oppressed. Most women who cover don't see it that way. And here we must make great distinctions, not only historical, my mother who's in her 80s never covered. So there's a resurgence of the covering today. The Quran hasn't changed, right? It's been the same for 1400 years. So it says the same thing. Why, why is this happening? Is it a form of empowerment? Many women who cover say, I'm not commodifying my body the way that we do in the Western press, you know, use women's bodies to sell things. So my body's not a commodity. I can cover it up and, and just... <laughs> and still be a part. Yeah. And still be a part. Well, be a bigger part, yeah. right? So there's that. But it's also a question of identity. But there are so many things that can be said about this and it really depends on the country, it depends on the history, it depends on the degree of colonization, it depends on the reformers who came to power in many of these countries and what they did with women's rights from Ataturk to uh, right. Reza Khan in you Iran. You read about each country because yeah. everyone's different. You do. So for example in Iran uh, there was a, a great uh, under Reza Khan in, in early Iranian early history, yeah, in the 1920s, where there was a, a a banning of the veil, That's right. and then uh, the Islamic Republic comes to power, and then mm. the, the, it went from one extreme to another. Right. So, what do we learn from that? We learn how how women are sometimes used to establish the credentials of the country, the currency of the country. So, it's a, it's another kind of commodification. But I think the most important point that I would like us to think about is that the varieties of feminism, the varieties of status of women here, there, everywhere. Are they really differences in kind or are they differences in degree? Is it patriarchy or is it Islam? And those are two very distinct very good things, questions. right? When a woman here gets 80 cents to the dollar for a, a job that's done by a man, exactly. is that part of the same issue? Mm -hmm. Where is Islam there? It's mm -hmm. not really about Islam at all. You talk about getting to know the religion or the culture, et cetera, et cetera. I've got to tell you this little story because when Hurricane Ike hit the Gulf Coast uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, uh, we were out of water, we were out of electricity. Uh, my kids were calling or actually texting their friends, who has electricity, I'm going over there. I went to pick up my little girl at a friend's house who's, who's Islam, who's a Muslim, and uh, they were having Ramadan when I went to pick her up and I had my first Ramadan dinner during Hurricane cool. Ike and I've got to say that it was just beautiful. <clears throat> the, the ceremony, the, the tradition, the, the dates, the cinnamon chicken, I mean it was, a, it was an amazing thing but that's, I think you're right that we do have to know our neighbors. And, and really, how we, how were we introduced? You were introduced this way to the meal but it would be very different if it was a, a Christian family and there was a crisis, right? right? right. And, and really I think the other thing I would like us to think about also is take Islam out of the picture. Then what do we have there? How do we explain what we see? So a lot of people say, you know, we're really looking at Islam inappropriately. It's right. not about religion. The religions basically are the same and it's really a question of interpretation, interpretation. ultimately. And that leads to my next question, which is the revolutions in the Arab world, which is <clears throat> Did you expect this to happen? And if you didn't, what do you see as a future? And I know we're guessing here, but right. this is extraordinary. This is a revolution that I don't think anybody, I think everybody was caught off guard. So many countries all at once are... Right, separating. right, almost like a spreading thing. Well, like a domino effect. Mm, yeah, well, the, I think the first thing that we should think about is that revolution is a very specific term, at least in the academic world. So revolutions are rare when they really do happen. Chinese, the Russian, like that. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Then there's protest. There's massive protest. There's populist protest. And if we knew the history of Egypt, which most of us don't, we'd know that there has been protest before. But now there's Facebook and now there's internet, so we're clued in. And now there's 24-hour news and see, you know, right. So we, we, we hear it and see it so much more. It is phenomenal. Anytime people come to the streets and there is protest and there is violence, it's, it's noteworthy and we should listen and see what's happening. Was it expected? By definition, no. By definition, a revolution and, and much protest is not expected. Why this particular moment is a very interesting question. The impact of things like Facebook, that's very 
interesting. The role of women in all of this is very interesting very because, nice. yeah, they are allowed. They, the, the technology allows a form of participation. But women have always, always, always in that part of the world, in all parts of the world, participated. Whether we pay attention to it or not is a different set of questions, yeah. right? We want to thank you so much for being here and and making us part of this discussion because it's a worldwide discussion and one that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, I think you've enlightened us on. I want to take time. her classes. I, was I, know, I know. I know. That's, that's wonderful. wonderful. I felt like I was back in school. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, you you really have enlightened us. Thank on, you. On I things. appreciate it. Anytime. You guys do a great job too. Thank All right. You. Thank you so much. And we'll be back in a few minutes. Nominated to the federal bench in 1994 by President Clinton, Judge Vanessa Gilmore became the youngest sitting federal judge on the federal bench in the nation at the time. A trailblazer and legal pioneer for much of her life, she has been the youngest or the first. A mother, friend, mentor, and judge, she is also an author. And she also made another mark by becoming the first University of Houston graduate to take the bench at the federal level. A recipient of numerous civic awards for community service, today she remains active and engaged and is reaching new goals as an author. Author of You Can't Make This Stuff Up, it Tales from a Judicial Diva, and co-author of a book of the children of incarcerated parents called A Boy named Rocky. She's also working on books related to adoption. Thank you so much for joining Thank us, Judge. Thank you. I am delighted Pioneer to be Pioneer Judge. Here. I, I want to know, I, I'm just, well, you can't make this stuff up. It is an amazing little book. Uh, <laughs> it is so funny. And, and I know you have a lot of different anecdotes. Can you share at least one that you really think uh, is, is one of the best? You know, I, I wrote the book because, uh, you know, people need to understand that judges are just ordinary people, that right. we have a sense of humor too, and that sometimes we have the ability to laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be able to do that because when you're a judge, you know, 50% of the people think you're brilliant and the other 50% think that you're a complete mm -hmm. idiot. Right, right. Only the ones who think that you're crazy write about you on the internet, by the way. <laughs> uh, but some of the things that happen to you are really funny. Uh, one of the anecdotes I talk about in the book is how uh, I'm just out uh, enjoying dinner with a friend and, and some gentleman who we don't even know comes and starts trying to chat us up in, in the restaurant uh, and tells us that we should come and join uh, his party because uh, uh, it's the kind of place that you can go and just sort of reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, just last week I was up there telling people that I was a federal judge. I said, you don't say. And he said, yeah. I said, well, you know, I think I'll come and say I'm a federal judge, too. And he says, no, no, sweetie, it can't be that far-fetched. It's got to be more believable. <laughs> Story. Nobody and, and believes you know, that kind of that stuff That reminds happens. me, actually, of your chapter 19. No, I'm really, I'm a federal judge. And actually, that took place, if memory serves me, in a parking lot right there, uh, right there where you work and have been a judge. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just so funny because, you know, people, people look at you, and, you know, just like you beautiful ladies, they wouldn't imagine how accomplished you are. Uh, and they, they look at us, and sometimes people just seem to sort of discount who you are. Uh, and you have a choice every day, how you want to deal with the way that people People treat you. You can decide to let it raise your blood pressure and make you go crazy, or you can turn it into a funny story and a funny <laughs> exactly, book. Exactly. But some of the cases you handle are not funny. Uh, they're very serious. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the point that I want to make is that uh, statistics don't lie, and that uh, minorities, more minorities, especially Hispanics and African Americans, are incarcerated in mm -hmm. jails today. Uh, not just uh, in Texas, but in California, in Miami, uh, New York. How, how do you deal with that as a judge when you see so many minorities come before you? That's a really good question. And I remember one of the things I thought about when I was trying to decide whether or not this was uh, going to be my calling. And I talked to my pastor, Reverend Lawson, about it. And I said, do you think that you know, I should go to the federal bench? And he asked me to ask myself two questions. Could I do a good job and would it be good for the community? And I said I could do a good job. And he said, I think it would be good for the community to have somebody like you there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I look at the law differently because the law is the law and you have right. to right. abide by what the law is. But I think that just being being there and being aware of the needs of the people who come before you makes me uh, uh, 
glad that I have the opportunity to be in that position, and and that's why I ended up writing the first book that I wrote, which was a children for the uh, a, pa uh, a book for the children of incarcerated yeah. parents, because I really recognized and saw the need. So many children, particularly minor minority children, who were having difficulty in the community, difficulty in school because of the loss of their parents can to you incarceration. Can you talk about the collateral effect. Well, absolutely, because one of the things that uh, I have been blessed to be able to do is to go and speak and talk to a lot of children at schools and uh, interestingly I'm often asked to speak to the bad children or the children that are having issues and then a friend of mine said you know look and see how many of those children ask the next time that you're out doing that how many of them have incarcerated parents and I was at one school uh, a middle school with girls talking to 50 girls and I asked that question and 50 hands went up. No. 50 hands yeah. went up and so I realized that, that there was really a need to try to address that as an issue. I think that me being there and recognizing and seeing that issue is something that I bring to the table that may be different than some of my colleagues and that's why we wrote a board named Rocky uh, and also had it done in, in Spanish. Spanish. In Spanish. Absolutely. 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 Un niño, well, un niño llamado Roque. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's wonderful. Well, that that uh, brings us to the to the next question about how many cases you handle. How do you even have time to write books? Well, you know, I'm very blessed to have a very young child. Uh, I have a ten year old son, uh, and that means that I'm home doing homework most <laughs> nights, and uh, he goes to bed. This is a child who likes to sleep, and when he goes to bed, uh, I'm home. I'm mom, so I'm at home, and that gives me an opportunity to be at the computer writing yes, books. Yeah, with all due respect, <laughs> most people after well, most people don't. Have have the luxury of being a federal judge and the, res the awesome responsibility. But after spending an entire day being up since six in the morning, putting a child to bed, I think what they do is may watch a little TV, okay, well, and, 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 and read and, and read a little smut book, and not, and not get started on your third or fourth book. But I, I want to say something because I think it's indicative of how empowering. If you're empowered, you can take any situation and make the most of it. If I can only for a moment, um, because I actually think a boy named Rocky and all of the aftermath is going to be part of your amazing legacy. But getting back for a moment, if you can't make this stuff up. The genesis was someone, in essence, blogging about you and calling you a diva. Absolutely. She, she then took what could potentially not be such a positive. Let me let you tell well, the it's story. It's just like I say, every day, people might criticize you, and you have a choice on how you want to deal with that criticism. I have a 10-year-old who's kind of spoiled. I need to be around to take care of him. And so I can't afford to let people's criticism of me, particularly criticism on the internet, make my blood pressure go up. So it's the same situation. I took that funny blog comment where he called me a diva. At first I thought, I'm not a diva. You know, I went through, rolled through the five stages of grief. First I was sad, then I was mad, then I was in denial. And then I thought, and then I thought you know what, maybe I am a diva. I am a diva. I am a diva, and I'm not going to let him talk about me like that. And I decided to take that and turn it into a funny book. Now, originally, I wasn't even trying to write this particular book. I had another book uh, that you mentioned yes. uh, that I was writing, a uh, sort of an adoption book. And uh, I had an editor who was working on that. And I mentioned to her, I like to write these funny short stories about all this crazy stuff that's happened to me. And she said, let me see that book. And I said, well, it's not a book. It's just sort of a collection of stories. And she said, well, send it to me anyway. And so I did. And she said, this is your next book. And I said, Tales from a Judicial Diva. That's yeah. it. <laughs> I want to ask you more, more of a serious question. And it has to do recently, Inside uh, Job won the, the Oscar. And it was about the financial meltdown in the United States. Mm. And one of the things that I hear all the time is, you know, no one's paying for the crimes, the financial crimes that were committed in Wall Street or around the country. And yet you told me that's not true. And it's not true. <laughs> you know, I, I think that... Uh, that some of the things that we do as judges are mundane. Uh, just taking care of the cases that we take care of, they're, they're not all cases that make the news. And so when people think or say that nothing is happening or that no one is, is dealing no one is with financial crimes, crimes right. I think that it's just that they're not as sensational as you might think. A lot of it is just mundane, everyday stuff that happens that we just take care of. And, and, and the other thing is we don't see interestingly, uh, the press in our courthouse and in the courtrooms the way that they used to be. Uh, you know, back in the old days, everybody had the courthouse as a beat. You probably right. remember Minerva. Yeah, I do. We just don't, th there just isn't that much personnel that's available to cover the cases anymore. But in that documentary, it said the people, the, the people obviously people high up, were not, nobody was paying for their crime at the national level. 
I, you, know, you see it every day. You see that people are going to jail for committing financial crimes. Financial crimes. White crime. Financial crimes, yes, absolutely. I see people low in the, in the lower totem pole? Or? I can't tell you, you know, where they right. fit in the scheme of things. But I think that it would be, uh, you know, incorrect to say that there, there, there isn't a concerted effort, particularly by this administration, to deal with and address financial crimes. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's important. Mm -hmm. And it's still going on. I mean, going the Enrons on. will continue, I think, to to happen. Or oh, other types of cases, yeah. you know, that happen every day. It's just that it's not the headline grabbing kind of stuff that you, you know, may well, have seen during that Lucky for you that, that the press is not haunting you every day, actually. That's a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm assuming you cannot give your opinion on this. I don't know. But there, there's a lot of people who criticize how children are being tried as adults for murder, let's say, mm -hmm. in Texas. Your thoughts on that, knowing what's happening with these kids and, and the parents? Are not. You know, I don't have anything to do with that because, of course, that would be in the state court right. system. And so I, I can't even tell you that I have yep. uh, a complete and clear uh, understanding of, of the system in terms exactly. of how they make that evaluation because that is something that happens in the state what, court what, system. Quite frankly, though, uh, next time we obviously should have a talk about is the whole issue of immigration mm -hmm. um, because there's a fair amount of sensing that goes through, mm -hmm. uh, through that. So absolutely to the federal. Well, thank you thank very, you so very much, much for lovely. joining us. Appreciate it. Thank yes, you very much for having me. Yes, on a of levels, terrific. We'll be back shortly. We want to thank you for tuning in to Latina Voices Smart Talk. And we invite you next time for some thought-provoking topics sure to pique your interest. So until next time, I'm Minerva Perez, and on behalf of the Latina Voices team, stay smart, everybody, and don't forget to join us on Facebook.com and latinavoices.com. Latina Voices is proudly sponsored by Continental Airlines, the official airlines of Latina Voices Smart Talk. Goya Foods, when it's Goya, it's got to be good. And Fiesta Mart, serving you since 1972.